everyone. Get ready for a captivating journey that will leave you craving for more. From exploring the depths of our world to understanding the human psyche. Come join us on this adventure. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Tyler. And this is the Edible Attitude Podcast. Hello, love. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastical. Good. Yeah. Good to hear. Mm-hmm. How's life? Life's great. Yeah, that's good. Read anything interesting today? Did I read anything interesting today? Yeah. I was working all day. Yeah, well, when you weren't working, were you reading anything interesting, like news headlines, something that popped up, came up? Just the stuff that we're going to talk about later understandable but no i really honestly didn't have time to do anything other than this and my work today so i didn't sit and read news articles today good job for being busy yeah i even stayed late that never happens well you wanted to get shit done i sure did so i didn't want it sitting there in my inbox for tomorrow that's smart understandable i think because i have a feeling tomorrow could be busy right Preemptive strike. Yes, that. Mm-hmm. Now we have customers coming in tomorrow. Ooh, big day, huh? It is, because they're a big customer. Oh, wonderful. They have to come in and inspect their factory. You know, I never understood that. Like, why Why would they care? If they got their shit, like, why would it matter? You know? Well, they have to make sure, you know, like, ethically, that we're doing things the right way. Really? This is America. We don't... <coughs> We don't ever do anything ethically the right way. Let's be honest. <laughs> and they have to make sure that we're up to code on everything they want us to be up to code on. OSHA doesn't give a shit. Oh, yes, they do. They never show up anywhere. They only show up at, like, construction sites as far as, oh. to my knowledge. Okay, well. You ever seen OSHA in your building? In the building that you work at? No, because we don't have accidents. We do, but. Yeah, no, because you never... guys are a bunch of fucktards. Right. I'm just kidding. But we don't ever see them, so... Maybe you don't see them. Maybe just your bosses see them. Why don't you ask your boss Friday? Yo, have you ever seen OSHA in here? That's a good idea. I probably should. I'm going to ask someone tomorrow. Okay. And report back. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Sounds good. Did you read anything interesting today? Who am I kidding? You don't read. It's okay. Well, nothing really interesting that Mm. I haven't already heard before, like... There's a war happening, people are dying, sickness, yada, 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 yeah, corruption, king, whatnot. The king has cancer. You should oh, care yeah, about that. Oh, yeah, that's right. He does have cancer. He does. Man, she was older than sliced bread, and he can't live <laughs> for a year being king. Man, she had it figured out. Let me tell you. Long live the queen. Long live the queen. Not my monarch. Not my monarch. Yeah, we're, we're not British. Yeah, exactly. That's why he's not my monarch. Amen. Plus, those lineages are always fucking weird. It's The whole thing is just weird. You know, one day someone conquered the land, so they're king. And then they suddenly have heirs. Yeah, because they... Well, everybody fucks. Well, no, I get that, but I mean, like, before they conquered the land, they didn't have heirs for that land. No, but once they became self-proclaimed monarch of the realm... Oh. You know, any of their legitimate children would automatically be heir to that claim. My question is, how did they figure out, like, if they conquered a place, how did they figure out where the fuck the borders were? They just kept pushing until they got, you know, and they fight until they... Yeah, but how would they know? You can't physically see the border because it's all just land. Yeah, because at one point, the Romans owned everything, and then eventually it all kind of, over time, evolved into borders. Well, even, like, states... States. Same thing. The only thing they have is like signs. Welcome to Indianapolis. Okay, or well that's a whole other podcast. So what are we going to talk about instead of that? Well, we're going to talk about lesser known historical events. Ooh, so we were, I was kind of on the right track. Kind of. Yeah. Sort of. Have you ever heard of the dancing plague? I have, but I don't know much about it. All I know is that uh, some lady 
started dancing and then a bunch of other people started dancing and then the priest was concerned and then he started dancing so it was a whole thing and then a bunch of people died from exhaustion that's w- that's what I remember. Well, on to the next one. That's bullshit. No, I'm just kidding. I can give you a little bit more information than that. <laughs> but yeah, that's the gist of it. Absolutely. Bring it on. See, I knew a little bit. <clears throat> you did. Absolutely. So the dancing plague happened in 1518. Good Lord. Yeah, no, a long time ago. Holy crap, that's about five, 500 years ago. Oh my God, that just kind of smacked me in the face. Anyway, in the small town of Strasbourg, France... A mysterious phenomenon gripped its inhabitants in the summer of 1518. Over Mm -hmm. 400 people became afflicted with an uncontrollable urge to dance. 400? 400, yeah. Oh, my thought was like thousands. Oh, no. For whatever reason, I don't know why. Leading to exhaustion, injury, and even death. I think maybe some of the things you saw were just exaggerating. Oh, probably. Yeah, Yeah, it's the internet. True. The outbreak began in July 1518 when a woman called Frau Trophia began to dance fervently in the street of Strasbourg. Trophia kept up the constant dancing for a week. Soon, three dozen others joined in. By August, the dancing plague had claimed 400 victims. Dancers were beginning to collapse. It is said some even died from a stroke or heart attack. No one knew what caused this reaction, which meant no one understood how to remedy it. And by early September, the outbreak began to subside when the dancers were sent to a mountain shrine to pray for absolution. So she danced for a week? Straight. Mm, correct. And did everybody else dance for a week straight after they began dancing? Or was she still dancing she was, when they joined in? Yeah, she was still dancing when they joined in. Holy shit. And then they've been dancing for a couple months at this point. Holy shit. Like well, not sleeping or anything. I don't know. They don't really say. It says historical documents including physician notes, cathedral sermons, local and regional chronicles, and even notes issued by the Strasbourg City Council are clear that the victims danced. It is not known why. Historical sources agree that there was an outbreak of dancing after a single woman started dancing, and the dancing did not seem to die down. It lasted for such a long time that it even attracted the attention of authorities, until the council gave up authority to the physicians, who prescribed the afflicted to dance themselves free of it. Doctors were like, I don't fucking know, just dance. Till you die. Yeah. I figured it out. I know why they did it. Oh? Yeah. They had ants in the pants. They sure did. You're right. Just like that game. Holy crap. You just solved a 500-year-old mystery. Well, when you really look at the hard evidence, you, it's pretty easy to figure That's out. That's true. I can't believe these idiots didn't figure this <laughs> out so long ago. God. Well, they didn't think about the ants. Okay. You're right. It might have been didn't. different ants. Probably. I would see them just used to like black ants. Mm-hmm. They, those just tickle. What if they were like red ants? Well, they also bite you, don't they? Just, yeah, like know, start would... dancing. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. Yeah, oh, just wiggling them back and yeah. forth. How did they, did they dance specifically in a way like the no, cha-cha and whatnot? No. Or were no. they just fucking flailing? They're probably just flailing. <laughs> I have no idea, though. I mean, it's not like they're like, they dance the samba. I mean, there's no samba back then. But, you know, they did they even have, like, actual dance names back then? Who knows? For all I know, it was a sin to dance. I mean, you know. Oh. I don't know. Well, I bet you they tried to cha-cha slide. Cha-cha oh. real smooth. That's probably exactly. She just got that in her head. And she can't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. See? what? When, when you ever get a song in your head and oh, it yeah. sticks there for a while? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what happened. She just made some shit up, which is all, you know, what music is, essentially. Right. And it just started going. Mm-hmm. And she was like, this is so amazing. I got to keep going. In the name of God. In the name of God. The Father and... The Holy Ghost and yes, whatnot. that stuff. There are claims that guild halls were refurbished to accommodate the dancing, as well as musicians and strong people to help keep those dealing with the dancing mania to stay upright. Well, thank God it wasn't around the footloose time, because people <laughs> would have went to jail for sure. <laughs> I think they wanted to throw them into the into the jail, but but you said they went like, to, whatever. You said they went to a church <clears throat> for absolution. Well, I'm getting to that point. Oh, okay. That's sorry. when it started a couple months later. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. This backfired, and the council was forced to ban public dancing as people danced in fear it was a punishment from St. Vitus. And to be free of sin, many joined in on the dancing epidemic. Oh, so they just joined in. They're like, okay. They joined in because they thought they had to. <laughs> Sheep mentality. Yep. The council went as far as to ban music. Oh, my. Well, mm-hmm. you can't stop. It's in their head. True. Those who danced were then ordered to go to the Shrine of St. Vitus, wore red shoes that were sprinkled with holy water, and had painted crosses on the tops and soles. Okay, so 
you said Saint Vitus. Mm-hmm. I thought you said Satan Itis. Yes. <laughs> like the devil overtook him. <laughs> That's what they dance. named it. One hundred percent. Satan Itis. I guess I need to enunciate better. I do apologize. No, no, no. I heard you. My brain said something different. Oh, okay. They also had to hold small crosses in their hands, and incense and Latin incantations were part of this ritual. Apparently, forgiven by Vitus, word was spread of a successful ritual, and the dancing plague has ended. So it just stopped abruptly as it began, or what? Yeah, because they sent them up there, to, and then they did a ritual from the saints that they thought that they were being being cleansed by the saints. So, like, don't worry, you got cleansed at the shrine of the saint, whatever his name is. You can stop dancing now. And they're like, oh, thank God. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. There was other similar events said to have occurred throughout medieval age, including in the 11th century in Saxony, where it was believed to be the result of demonic possession or divine judgment. And in the 15th century in Italy, a woman was bitten by a tarantula, the venom making her dance convulsively. I don't think the venom was making her dance convulsively. She was probably having a freaking seizure. Or a stroke, one of the two. Good lord. Or a heart attack because of the venom. The only way to cure the bite was to shimmy and to have (laughs) the right sort of music available. Hell yeah. Which was an accepted remedy by scholars, which is hilarious. You gotta shimmy it away. Shimmy. (laughs) What a workout. Bet Bet you... Fat people lost at least 20 pounds that month. They weren't fat back then unless you were rich, so there was no fat people. What about like uh, like friars? Friars were always pictured as bald and fat, right? That's true, but they were you know men of God, so they got fed by the parishioners. Mm, that's fair. I wonder what the ritual was like, or what it was. They said... Just beat them till they stopped. They said they had to hold small crosses, wear red shoes, um, hold incense in their hands, and Latin incantations were said. They didn't say anything about beating. They just did a ritual with Latin incantations and incense. Please, Lord, forgive us our sins of dancing for no reason. Okay, okay, you can stop now. I'm cared. (laughs) Wonderful. Praise Allah. I don't think Allah was in France at the time, (laughs) but okay. Allah is just another word for God. I know that. So you're saying God wasn't in France at the time? He sure wasn't if they were were all dancing for no apparent reason. They were dancing for the Lord. All right, my next one. Are you ready for this? Oh, I'm not. Okay. I wasn't ready for that first one. Yes, you were. You knew all about it. I kind of knew about it, but I didn't know about the shimmying. That was interesting. All right, this one is the Great Emu War. I have heard about this. What do you know about it? That it's against Australia and emus, but there have been two emu wars, and they lost both of them. It wasn't two wars, just two attempts at a war, I guess, two wars. But still, they're giant goddamn (coughs) birds. Big, ugly, evil ostriches. Yeah. Well, smaller than ostriches, but that's beside the point. You want to hear about it? Sure do. Okay, good. Well, did you know that Australia once waged war against a seemingly harmless foe? Emus? Yeah, sure did. In 1932, Australian farmers armed with machine guns faced off against an army of emus, wreaking havoc on their crops. So it's a farmer versus emu war. Yes. Okay. The Emu War, or the Great Emu War, was a nuisance wildlife management military operation undertaken in Australia over the later part of 1932 to address public concern over the number of emus said to be destroying crops in the Campion district within the wheat belt of Western Australia. Did you have something to say? You were gesturing wildly over there. I'm just waiting to hear their excuse as to why they lost this thing. Other than the fact that they're not America, because America would have won. The unsuccessful attempts to curb the population of emus employed Royal Australian Artillery soldiers armed with Lewis guns, leading the media to adapt the name Emu War when referring to the incident. Although many birds were killed, the emu population persisted and continued to cause crop destruction. How many were killed? Only 400. Out of how many? Well, I I guess they don't really have a count. That's kind of hard to figure that out, but okay. Right. Only 400 were uh, eradicated, huh? Well, here it says the farmer's difficulties were worsened by the arrival of approximately 20,000 emus. Where the fuck did they come from? They 
uh, regularly migrate after their breeding season, heading to find the coast from the inland regions. Oh. Yeah, with the cleared land and additional water supplies being made available for livestock by the Western Australian farmers, the emus found that the cultivated lands were good habitat, and they began their foray into farm territory. That would be horrifying. You just walk out your porch one day with a cup of coffee, and there's just a sea of menacing birds looking at you. Yeah, that would be terrifying. Yeah. Like, what would you do? I'd well, shit my pants. I, I would be my like... Pants yours now. Goodbye. I'd be like, we gotta, we gotta move. That's almost as bad as spiders. Yes. But spiders, I'd burn the house down. The emus, I'd let them have the house. Yeah, they can have it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The emus consumed and spoiled the crops and left large gaps and fences where rabbits could enter and cause further problems. Bastards. So the farmers relayed their concerns about the birds ravaging their crops, and deputation of ex-soldiers were sent to meet with the Minister of Defense, Sir George Parse. Having served in World War I, the soldier settlers were well aware of the effectiveness of machine guns and requested their deployment. Lovely. That's probably why they didn't win. Requested machine gun deployment, and that's why? I don't don't know if machine gun was the correct weapon of choice. I feel like a shotgun would work better, or just a mounted fifty cal. You get rid of a lot of birds (laughs) that way. Well, the minister readily agreed, although with conditions attached. The guns were to be used by military personnel, troop transport was to be financed by the Western Australian government, and the farmers would provide food, accommodation, and payment for the ammunition. How many troops? It doesn't say. Just a bunch? Yeah. Handful? A bunch? All in all, all they were able to with two conflicts. You can call it two conflicts. Okay. <laughs> um, le- well, actually, less than a thousand emus were... Eradicated. Or eradicated. Huh. So it was like just under a thousand. I was wrong. Sorry. I misremembered something. But yeah, less than a thousand. So they had 20, they probably had like 50,000 of these fuckers just running around. Oh my God. Why didn't they use something bigger? This was 19, this was in the 1930s. They didn't know any better. They still had grenades and stuff. And stuff. They could have cooked their food yeah, but, and killed it at the same time. But imagine throwing a grenade. They'd, the birds would just run away and then they wouldn't really kill anybody. Emus are stupid. They'd probably think it's a rock. Who is it? Peck, 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 peck. Boom. Gone. Kind of like, hey, hey, the chicken. Yeah. Well, I know that wasn't all that interesting, but we'll go on to the next one. Sweet. But to close on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, do better? Like, what the? F- Come on. What are you doing? There was a little bit more. I didn't get this information. There's a little bit more about later on, but they really pretty, they pretty much just gave up on it. Yeah. There's these things called, well, I mean, fences. They were knocking them down, I guess. Build bigger ones. Or, like, metal ones. Or electric ones. There you go. Or just set up traps. I, just I don't had, know. It's so weird that the Australians were letting emus get the better of them and they got fucking kangaroos yeah and crocodile no and poisonous shit yeah but they fall to they fall to the flightless birds good lord it's like americans losing their house to worms that's a pathetic that sounds (laughs) this is so true there's worms in my basement well gotta move gotta move can't do anything about it you gotta get the government involved yeah although emus i think are pretty aggressive aggressive or not but a 50 cal in your brain ain't going to do anything <laughs> for the bird. He's just going to die. The bird's going to be dead. Like, he can't do anything after that. You eat emu, though. Emu's good. Yeah, it is. I've, I've had it. I've it's, had it. It's tender. Very tender. It tastes like chicken. It does. It does not. It tastes like pork. No, it tastes like chicken. Uh, I think it tastes like chicken. I don't know. I'm just... Step your game up, Australia. You started with convicts. Yeah. What are you doing? All those venomous and poisonous animals. Yeah, and they box kangaroos for fun. And then they ran away from emus? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Come on. What are you doing? Have they disappointed you? They have. You know what? We should. They should just get sold to Japan. Aren't they close to Japan? Yeah. They should get sold to, J- to Japan just for that. <laughs> just for that, huh? Well, at least Japan could bolster their numbers with more or could have at the time i guess yeah but still like what the f- what the fuck that's an outrageous 
not so fun fact. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't find my facts fun. Well, that one wasn't fun. That was just irritating because it's like, <laughs> what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> God, God. Machine guns. If you are enjoying this topic and you would like to talk more about it, you can find us at Edible Attitude or at Edible Attitude Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All right, on to my next one. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, because you weren't ready before. so I'm ready now. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. The Great Molasses Flood of Boston. Was there a fire in Boston <laughs> also at some point in history? I'm sure there was. And they had a tea party too. They did have a tea party. No, I feel like there's there's a lot more history with Boston from, like, disasters, mm-hmm. like fires and shit. I know there's the Great Chicago Fire. There's mm-hmm. that. Um, during the Prohibition, there's a bunch of, like, booze dumped out into the, mm-hmm. you know, the road Everywhere. to make, like, a river, basically. Mm-hmm. That would be insane. <laughs> People just getting hammered by smelling the booze in the street. <laughs> Yeah. Children, don't go outside. There's worms out there. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it be? Anyway, what about this molasses? Okay. In 1919, a peculiar disaster struck the streets of Boston. A massive wave of molasses. Okay, so what happened is there was a ruptured storage tank unleashed a deadly tidal wave of sticky sweet syrup, causing destruction and claiming lives. Isn't that crazy? Anyway. Get swallowed up by a wave of molasses, yeah. huh? Oh, the what great, a terrible yeah. way to go. The Great Molasses Flood, also known as the Boston Molasses Disaster. Oh, my God. Say that five times. The fast. Boston Molasses Disaster. <laughs> yeah, well, that was pretty good. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> got to enunciate disaster better. The Boston Molasses Disaster. <laughs> that was good. I liked it. It was a disaster that occurred on Wednesday, January 15th, 1919. Oh, wow. Just over 100 years ago. That was 11 years before fucking Australia disappointed the world. (laughs) Good God. 1900s were a rough time. The 1900s were indeed a rough time. A large storage tank filled with 2.3 million gallons, weighing approximately 13,000 short tons, burst, and the resultant wave of molasses rushed through the streets at an estimated 35 miles per hour. Oh, Oh, my. Killing 21 people and injuring 150. I mean, if molass- if sticky syrup is cruising that fast, it ain't getting out of its way. Mm-mm. The event entered local folklore and residents reported for decades afterwards that the area still smelled of molasses on hot summer days. Is it is it gone away now? I'm assuming. I didn't smell it when I was there. Oh, okay. And I was there on a hot summer day, so I think it's gone. Okay. But, so yeah. what caused this tank to go boom? Well, let's see. Damage to the Boston Elevated Railway caused by the burst tank and resulting flood. This is part of the aftermath. Sure. First to the scene were 116 cadets under the direction of Lieutenant Commander H.J. Copeland. That wasn't enough people for one. That wasn't enough people? 116? No. no. Needed at least more. A training ship of the Massachusetts Nautical School now the Massachusetts Maritime Academy that was docked nearby at the playground pier. The cadets ran several blocks toward the accident and entered into the knee-deep flood of molasses to pull out the survivors, while others worked to keep curious onlookers from getting in the way of the rescuers. Boston Police, Red Cross, Army, and Navy personnel soon arrived. Oh, good. They brought more people. Yep. Good. Some nurses from the Red Cross dove into the molasses, while others tended to the injured, keeping them warm and feeding the exhausted workers. Now, when I hear that, I imagine the, you know, them diving in. Oh, yeah. Head first. Whee! Just fucking belly flopping in there. I got you. Splat. Right. So, wait. This molasses wasn't hot? What was it used for? It was just a molasses factory, huh? Could have been. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how they did things 100 years ago. I'm not that old. I mean, that that's, a, that's a lot of molasses, so that would make sense if it was just a It was like in a tank. Spe- yeah, right. Yeah. Many of these people worked through the night and injured, and the injured were so numerous that doctors and surgeons set up a makeshift hospital in a nearby building. Rescuers found it difficult to make their way through the syrup to help the victims, and four days elapsed before they stopped searching. Many of the dead were so glazed over in molasses that they were hard to recognize. Ooh. Yeah. Rough. Other victims were swept into Boston Harbor and were found three to four months after the disaster. Still wrapped in molasses? <laughs> um, no, because they were in the water. They found them in the water. Oh. 
That would be wild if they were still wrapped in molasses. Right? In the wake of the accident, 119 residents brought a class action lawsuit against the United States Industrial Alcohol Company. So it's the booze's fault. I guess. The company claimed that the tank had been blown up by anarchists because some of the alcohol produced was to be used in making munitions, but a court-appointed auditor found USIA responsible after three years of hearings. Oh. Yep. So, ultimately, the company paid out $628,000 in damages, which is roughly $11 million today. Holy shit. And the relatives of the killed reportedly received around $7,000 per victim, which is an equivalent to about $120,000. Still not enough. Nope, not at all. There's, I bet you there's, there's one no. kid that's like, I'm going to find this president. And he found him, backed him into a corner, and he goes, what do you want from me? Do you want more money? And he goes, no, I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why you got to do that to me? You're probably right, though. Because my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Now prepare to die. That'd be cool if that happened, though. Just saying. Just saying. Quoting a movie that hasn't even come out yet. You go, (laughs) little dude. (laughs) That would be amazing. That guy grew up to be Barack Obama. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. He's a time traveler. Crazy. Okay, so the cleanup crews used salt water from a fireboat to wash away the molasses and sand to absorb it. Oh, hold on, hold on. You said fire boat. My mind went to this boat's on fire <laughs> shooting water just to prevent it from sinking <laughs> or no, getting... You got to have fire boats because what if there's a fire on a ship in the harbor? I, I get that. I, I get that now, but oh, okay. initially I, sorry. my brain said fire boat. Fire! <laughs> Ooh, fire. <laughs> it's on fire. Put it out. You're pointing the gun the wrong way, moron. <laughs> All right. Well, no, it's, it's a fire boat, kind of like a fire truck. Mm, just I get, a fire I get that truck. now. Okay. All right. Let's 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 carry on. That boat must have been interesting to ride on. Big old <laughs> cannon shooting out of there. Yeah. The, uh, the cleanup in the immediate area took weeks, with several hundred people contributing to the effort, and it took longer to clean the rest of greater Boston and its suburbs. Rescue workers, cleanup crews, and sightseers had tracked molasses through the streets and spread it to subway platforms, to the seats inside trains and streetcars, and into homes, and to countless other places. It was reported that everything that a Bostonian touched was sticky. That's bullshit! Sounds like a good time during, uh... Prohibition. That too. (laughs) I was going to say Mardi Gras, but okay. Oh, well, it was Prohibition. Well, everything's sticky. Can't stop the stickiness when you're having fun, babe. But that's not so fun if people die, so. Yeah, we don't want people to die because of the stickiness. So how far did this molasses go? Like square footage. Can I don't you know. That out? You'd have, I, I'm not mathematically inclined. Was it, it the entirety of Boston? I don't know. It just There was a storage tank with 2.3 million gallons, and it went we had a resultant wave of molasses through the streets at 35 miles per hour, so you have to do a lot of math, and I, I can't. So what you're saying is it went everywhere. Yeah. Depending on where it was in Boston, it probably just, it burst and then it went down everywhere it could go. Sidewalk, hmm. you know, paths, alleyways. What a time to be alive. Damn skippy. Onwards and upwards uh, to the mid-century onion debacle. There's an onion debacle? I don't know. I just read the title. I'm like, oh, this is going to be funny. It kind of is, but it's kind of, you know, I'm going to kind of paraphrase and stuff. I know you can put onions in your socks to cure colds, no, apparently. You can't. Or put like can half an pl- onion in your room. Can we like not believe everything on the internet, please? I did it. I was not cured. Yes, I know because it doesn't work. It feels weird though. You know, there's another thing that if you cut a slice of potato and you do the same thing and in the morning it's all brown, it's, it's all the toxins that came out of your your foot, right? No, it's because it's oxidized, you fucking moron. Have you ever cut a potato and just left it? They turn brown. Why would I just cut a potato and let, leave it? That would be... Science. R- so, for science, huh? Right. Well, I didn't try that for science. I would be afraid that it would grow sprouts out of it and we'd have to remove it from the vicinity of our house. Because, you know... Well, you're scared of a potato plant? I don't like potatoes when they get all <laughs> veiny and stuff. When you leave them there for like a week or oh, something, oh, they start... A week? You start sprouting whatever they sprout. I'm assuming they're trying to grow and get yes. the fuck out of the house. Yes. I can only imagine what it would look like 
in like an abandoned house. You just walk in and there's just fucking potatoes everywhere. <laughs> One yeah. guy would probably be like, what are these potato dicks doing all over the place? Potato dicks? Why are they potato dicks? Well, because they're long and hard. Oh, God. They're like roots, but not. Anyway, so in the mid-1950s, onions became the most traded commodity on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. However, <laughs> thanks to the onion debacle, the rules of trading have changed dramatically and onion futures are the only banned trading commodity in the United States. Hey man, you got a gun? No, but I got onions. <laughs> Fuck, great. Give me three of them. <laughs> what, what kind you got? I got red. I got yellow. I got white. <laughs> what about Vidalia? You got those? I don't know what those are, so no. <laughs> Sure don't. I just got the normal ones. <laughs> Those are the sweet ones. They're sweet onions? You didn't know they were sweet onions? I had no idea. Well, now you do. Huh. Is that why Shrek ate those? Uh, maybe. No, I'm pretty sure those are just red. But they have layers. Just like ogres. They have layers. Just like you? No. Oh. And parfaits. <laughs> they... Yeah. They... <laughs> That'll do, donkey. That'll do, donkey. That'll do. Okay, but how did this happen? Yeah, how did how did we go from <laughs> fucking molasses? Wait, what year did this take place? In the 1950s, mid-50s. Okay, so it's past yeah. the uh, past the the flooding of the molasses. Yes. And past the emus. Yeah, those evil mm-hmm. things. So we're going into the 50s with. Yes. An onion debacle. Yeah, it's... Yes. In the 50s. Yes. They could have worried about something else. Like, I don't know. The economy? No. They got to worry about onions, huh? Cold War. Or that. In 1955, Sam Seagal and Vincent Kosuga took advantage of an oversupply of onions. They bought tons of onions and onion futures, which just means it's a term referring to the contract buyers have with sellers to buy a commodity in the future for the price set today. No, I don't know. I don't care. But anyway, eventually the two men controlled 98% of all Chicago's onions, owning around 30 million pounds of the vegetable. Hey, what does your dad do? My dad's in the onion mafia. (laughs) (laughs) The fuck? Once they gained so much control over the market, Seagal and Kasuga began short-selling onion futures. Short-selling or shorting happens when a futures seller sells borrowed futures. This is done in the hopes that when they need to pay the owner of those shares, the price of the future has dropped, making the sellers a profit. So they're selling pink slips for onions? Mm-hmm. What the fuck? Yeah. So while That's short- so weird. Well, 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 I guess not really pink slips, like contracts. Yeah. Onion contracts. Yeah. This isn't Fight Club. What the hell? We don't talk about it. Anyway, while shorting futures is usually a guessing game, Seagull and Kosuga weren't guessing or hoping for a positive outcome. They were fully aware that if they suddenly released their onion stock into the market, supply would increase and their price would dramatically decrease. Yeah, so basically, so they took it one step further. When their previously bought onions began spoiling, they cleaned and repackaged them, making them look new. Oh, God. This ultimately signaled to futures traders that onions were in abundance, driving the price of onions down even more. Wouldn't they want the price of onions to go up so yeah. they get paid more money? Right. They're, they're trying. but So while they made millions of dollars, but as one can imagine, it had rippling effects across the country. The rest of the United States faced onion shortages thanks to the sheer number of vegetables in Chicago, where they were sold for around 10 cents a bag. This low price ultimately caused bankruptcy for many onion farmers. Yeah, because no one else knew about the onion mafia. Right. Gotta watch out for that onion mafia. If there was more people in the onion mafia, this wouldn't have happened. There there would have been equal shares of all the territories (laughs) of onions. But no, two corrupt motherfuckers Mm -hmm. had to take all the onions. Mm -hmm. You know, the Don of the onion mafia wasn't very thoughtful. He wasn't. Good Lord. The Commodity Exchange Authority realized what was happening and decided to amend the Commodity Exchange Act. Even now, almost 70 years later, onion futures trading is still prohibited, 
along with cornering entire markets like Siegel and Kasuga did. So now so, you can't do that no more. So no more m- Onion, vegetable mafia. Correct. Is that just in America? Total? Yeah. Or yes. just in... Mm-hmm. That's the only one that's banned. Just onions. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. But, but no one's going to do anything else as I saw what happens. No one wants to do that. Yeah, no one wants to be a part of a vegetable mafia. Doesn't seem very that, profitable. That is what's wrong with the country. There's no vegetable mafia? Yes. We need some. We need somebody to gatekeep the vegetables. They do. They so can gatekeep all the tomatoes they want because them's is nasty. Nasty tomatoes. You're wrong. No, I'm correct. There's no debate on this. Tomatoes are nasty. Mm, well, I like them. The only tomatoes that are great are the tomato smoothies that I put on my hot dogs and burgers. Why? I'm not going to No, we need to get no. Why? I don't know, because they don't taste like squishy nastiness in your mouth. <laughs> squishy nastiness. Yeah, tomatoes are nasty. You bite into them, they explode all over your face, and you're like, ah, I feel so dirty now. <laughs> Why are there seeds in my teeth? You got some juice on your cheek, bro. Ha, ah, fuck. People found out. <laughs> anyway, I have another story. More. That was the end of the Onion Mafia. So no more... No more... No more Onion Mafia. No more illegal <laughs> vegetable trading. How many years did that go on for? Oh, it wasn't very long. It was like a year. Yeah. It wasn't very long. Yeah, America shut that down real quick. They're they like, nah, this, <laughs> this mafia is ridiculous. <laughs> We're not having this bullshit again. Yeah. But the other type of mafia, that's fine. Well, duh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the government was getting money from them. Oh, yeah. It's the oldest story in the book. Where was the cartel at the time? They could have helped the mafia with this problem. I'm sure they are part of it. No, it's just those guys. It's just those guys. Yeah, but I, I don't think they knew what was happening until it was happening. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Sure. Until America found out about it first and like, shit, that was a perfect opportunity to hide coke and tomatoes. Why tomatoes, sir? Because no one likes tomatoes. We can move them pretty easy. All right. So this last one, it's called Acoustic Kitty. Did you mean Autistic Cat? That's bullshit. Nope. I I really didn't. (laughs) But that's why I chose this one because it made me giggle because of what we call our cat. Our cat is definitely acoustic, let me tell you. (laughs) Sometimes he just skirts, skirts for no reason. Did I tell you what he did the other day? He jumped off my lap. Got down, sat on the floor, looked up at the ceiling, and disappeared in an instant. (laughs) Came back, was like, meow, meow. Like, what are you doing? What are you? Why didn't you follow me? (laughs) And I was like, what? And then he jumped back on my lap and promptly went to sleep. So whatever that was about, no clue. (laughs) He was gone for maybe ten minutes. I don't know what he was doing. Was he pooping? I don't think so, because I didn't hear him scratching at the door at all or anything. <laughs> Why does he do that? I have no idea. <laughs> Every time he goes to the bathroom, he scrape, just scrape. he just scrapes the side of his his litter box. There's no apparent reason for it. He, I was in there uh, washing my hands one day, and they were, and he was in his litter box. And he just started sc- <laughs> scraping. I'm like, what are you doing? And it's his front paw. He's not, like, covering anything. Mm-hmm, he's no. not moving anything around. <laughs> he's just like, oh, my God, there's stuff on it. And then he switches to the other yeah. one and then switches back like, I can't get it off. <laughs> I didn't watch him that closely. I didn't Fucking know Fucking acoustic <laughs> cat. Oh, my God. Let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, what about this real one? Okay. Well, this well, he's real, too, but. Acoustic kitty. He's look- right there. Yes. Look at him. <laughs> he's hiding. Acousticism is is really, really rough on these cats nowadays. Anyway, Acoustic Kitty was a CIA project launched by the Director of Science and Technology in the 1960s, which intended to use cats to spy on the Kremlin and Soviet embassies. Oh, so undercover cats, huh? Yeah. Okay, here's, okay. In an hour-long procedure... A veterinarian surgeon implanted a microphone in the cat's ear canal, a small radio transmitter at the base of its skull, and a thin wire into its fur. This would allow the cat to innocuously record and transmit sound from its surroundings. Due to problems with distraction, the cat's sense of hunger had to be addressed in another operation. Um, A former CIA officer said Project Acoustic Kitty costs about $20 million. To try to train cats, huh? Yes. 
okay. Yep. And this was in the 60s? Correct. Okay. <laughs> yep. So the first Acoustic Kitty mission was to eavesdrop on two men in a park outside the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. The cat was released nearby, but was hit and allegedly killed by a taxi almost immediately. I shouldn't laugh, but... He was pretty acoustic, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Good lord. However, this was disputed in 2013 by Robert Wallace, a former director of the Office of Technical Service, who said that the project was abandoned due to the difficulty of training the cat to behave as required. And the equipment was taken out of the cat. The cat was re for a second time and lived a long and happy life afterwards. Well, I'm glad he got released. He did his duty. He did. He's like, I'm out. He had he had this thought out. He's like, there's yeah. shit in my body. I'm killing myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be acoustic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Subsequent tests also failed. Shortly thereafter, the project was considered a failure and declared to be a total loss. However, other accounts report more success for the project. So the project was canceled in 1967, and a closing memorandum said that the CIA researchers believed that they could train cats to move short distances, but that the environmental and security factors in using this technique in a real foreign situation forced us to conclude that for our intelligence purposes, it would not be practical. Yeah, because that cat's going to go five feet and turn the wrong way and disappear yep. into oncoming traffic, apparently. <laughs> the project was disclosed in 2001 when the CIA, when some CIA documents were declassified. So, yeah, they canceled the project because they can't make a cat not be a cat. Right. I mean, cats got to be, cats got to just do cat things. You can train dogs a lot easier than cats. I don't understand why they didn't do that. Hell, you can train a snake better than you can train a cat. Cats just have a mind of their own. They're not they're not uh stupid. Yeah, but they're betcha crazy. It's understandable why they named the project the way they did. <laughs> because if you've seen a cat's behavior, he's definitely acoustic. Definitely. For sure. Other than just sitting and loafing around, mm-hmm. acousticism is strong. <laughs> That is all I have for you this evening. Awesome. I think my favorite one was the fucking emus. I know you can't get over that. I can't. <laughs> I can't move past that. It doesn't matter if the cats were uh, acoustic or not. And there was an onion Debacle. shortage. <laughs> Debacle. Whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Onion mafia. The fact that a whole ass country lost against some stupid birds <laughs> is unreal. Just retire immediately. I can't handle it. Go <laughs> go back to where you came from, because Australia ain't your thing. If you, you can deal with fucking poisonous shit and roid-raged animals, and you can fight them for fun, but you can't win against mid-sized ostriches? Like, come on. Mid-size. Oh, so, God. I like the dancing plague. Yeah, that one was wild. It was very wild. I like that one. It was my favorite. I'm still going with ants in the pants, and then the rest was just sheep mentality. Like, yeah. I, I bet you anything there was actually something wrong with th- these people and mm-hmm. they just couldn't figure out what and then you know obviously people joined in and danced and you know because they're afraid because mm-hmm. God and why not but holy shit I, I get that it was a long time ago and they didn't have the thought process we do now or the technology right. so they get a pass but, <laughs> but at the same time we still don't know what happened huh no how would how would we know and it hasn't happened since. Not other since. other than those three other But that instances. was all that was all like before the one that I talked about. Right. Everything else was before and it hasn't happened didn't happen after. But that one in France was the biggest one, right? Yes. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, and it hasn't happened again in five hundred years. Well, <laughs> internet, do your thing. Let's make it happen again. No flash mobs, just start dancing. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Wherever you are. <laughs> all over the place. New York would be <laughs> ideal. Just go to Times Square, hold them a sign that says the end is nigh, and start shimmying. <laughs> <laughs> shimmy, shimmy. It's the only way to get to get rid of it is a shimmy. Oh, yeah. Someone, uh, <laughs> someone will probably start dropping money at your feet. Be like, well, this person's on crack. <laughs> <laughs> Time to give them drug money. <laughs> oh, man. That was good, dear. That was good. I liked it. 
I'm glad you enjoyed it. Absolutely did. Well, that's all we got for tonight. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you, as always. Very much appreciated. For sure. And, as always, I'm Tyler. And I'm Elizabeth. And this is the Edible Attitude Podcast. <laughs>